Well, welcome everybody to the December 2017 Christmas holiday edition of the Roundtable. My name is Mark Robertson. I am founder and managing partner of Manifest Investing, and I'm joined here by my friends Ken Kavula and Cy Lynch. They're both national volunteers for the National Association of Investors, better known as Better Investing, and uh, just very long-time experienced successful investors who like to share their ideas. Say hello, gentlemen. Hi, everybody. Hello, everybody. And uh, th those are not the three inches of snow in Atlanta that we were just talking about on the screen. It's just a nice picture. From, uh, <laughs> if they got that much snow in Atlanta, we'd never hear from them again. No, but, you uh, would not. Uh, but no, not it's just, for a uh, year or two, anyway. The reason for the season, we'll, we'll jump right into things. But again, we just want to celebrate what has been a good year for many of us. I will share a short story. That I, just the other day, I received not one but two phone calls from investors who uh, – admitted that they'd taken a couple of months off and hadn't been paying a whole lot of attention. They were sitting down to quote unquote harvest losses for the year as they were preparing their, their tax situation for the coming year only to find out they didn't have any. So <laughs> two, two cases. And so that that's a pretty nice testimonial to this investing community. It's a, a wonderful situation to have when you uh, have to pay capital gains for all the right reasons every once in a while. So let's go ahead and get the legal paperwork out of the way. This, again, is an educational demonstration. No investment recommendation whatsoever is intended. We do this uh, as a demonstration, as an illustration of the philosophy and methods that have been put forth by Better Investing and the modern investment club movement for now better than 70 years. And uh, the views that are expressed by us are our own. Please do your own homework. We may actually hold some of these securities in our portfolios. We generally try to uh, call those out. But again, it, no investment recommendation is intended from what we do here. It is just to show the how of what we do. We try to share a few good ideas. Here's a quick look at the agenda for tonight, um, kind of a standing agenda. Again, welcome to everybody. It's been a, a good year for many of us as investors. Extra big welcome if you're here with us for the first time. We do... Uh, do a fairly informal setting here where you can check in either by the questions tab or you can actually raise your hand and enter in the discussion. Plus, we'll have a, a wide open question and answer at the end. We'll take a look at our results real quickly and uh, talk about 2017 for just a moment. But then we'll press on to challenge a few of the stocks that have actually done very well for us, but actually are kind of on the hot seat with our diminished expectations. Our three stocks for tonight by Cy Ken and myself are Priceline, Alta, Beauty, and Bemis. We do an audience poll, so the audience gets to select which one is their favorites from among those three or none of the above, and we'll take it from there. Here's a quick look at what we've been doing now for seven and a half years, doing this in these monthly webcasts. We really are just trying to bring an idea. It's usually pretty close to one of our single favorite investment ideas at a time, and we do tolerate some unusual selections from time to time that have actually worked out pretty well over the last seven and a half years, non-core or speculative or special situations, however you want to put it. And he was kind of an ex expert and pretty successful at that. We do keep track of what we do here. We do want the overall portfolio to beat the market by five percentage points and with the market as measured by the Wilshire 5000. We'd also like to have over half of our selections beat mirroring investments in the Wilshire 5000. Doing pretty good on that on that regard also. Here's a quick look at how we have been doing. Again, don't want to belabor the point because we want to get into the stock discussions and some of the other discussions. But again, over the last seven and a half years, the rate of return over that time frame is 14.8% annualized. That's the same type of score keeping or, or record keeping that is done with either the Bivio or the club accounting uh, methods. Uh, what you're looking at here is a graph of the relative return. That's a measure of how much, by how many percentage points are we beating the market. That, that red dotted line is five percentage points above the market. If we were at zero, we would be matching market performance. Again, matching the Wilshire 5,000 if we just invested the funds into that instead. So again, we want to live up here at this 5% line. And uh, we're, we've actually touched four 
we're just under four right now at uh, about three and a half percent over those seven and a half years. So we're pretty confident. The trend is certainly in the right direction, and we seem to be tickling our way up towards that 5% line. Keep in mind that over the last 12 months, that's what we're going to talk about next, it, it's been pretty tough to stay ahead of that beast, and we have managed to do that. <laughs> We've actually picked up ground even as the market has been quite, quite strong. So, again, about half the picks are, have beat the market since the time of selection. But, again, this is something that uh, – we're pretty proud of, and that's actually pretty rare performance to be able to stay ahead of the market that much. We talked about this a little bit last month. Here's another look at what is an unprecedented, absolutely unprecedented year in the stock market. There hasn't been a single down month. This is a stock price chart from stockcharts.com since October 2016. So we've actually already had more than 12 straight months. That's never happened before. And we've never had 12 calendar months actually uh, go up, beat the market, or actually have a gain every single calendar month. And we're headed for that this year. And uh, absent a complete collapse here in the last few days of the trading year, 2017, this one is coming home to roost. There are estimates that uh, the Dow will gain as much as 5,000 points this year. That's just a, a mind-boggling number in some ways. But uh, pretty strong year. How do you guys feel about uh, what we're faced with or what we have enjoyed here over the last year? It's It's been, as you say, a very unique market historically. And it, one thing that is very interesting about it is that it is uh, – um, very much of an aging bull. I mean, we've we've not had. I mean, we're we're going on now. What the eighth? Yeah, we're a little over eight years uh, since the market low, and we've not had a sign. I haven't checked a significant cor correction for what three and a half years, perhaps. Yeah, last it's time I looked, I, I believe uh, of of even a ten percent a correction. Uh, so it's very unique, and of course, there's certainly. We can play out uh, political potential reasons, but I, I wonder if part of what is driving the market is that finally the market as a whole is becoming a believer that the economy, albeit somewhat slow growing uh, by historical standards in an expansion, is for real. Um, because that the the bear and the financial collapse that occurred in 2008 2009 was just so unique that you know you did not have that big five percent or so growth coming out of the market and the Fed having to to uh, hike interest rates to slow it down and it, it you didn't have the typical recovery and uh, and they're still pockets of, of weakness in certain areas of employment. Uh, but I think for so long, people just didn't believe the economy was for real. And I think now we're beginning to believe it is. Yeah, I've got a slide a little bit later that shows the global side of that question. And it's it's really pretty compelling when you look at what's been going on outside the United States. We've been describing the global recession for, you know, many of these sessions going back a few years. And it'll be it kind of shows that that's also involved here also, I think. I, I think you're exactly right. Uh, the, uh, I think the global market. Well, Ken's being quiet, so I'll, I'll, I'm going to. Well, no, well, Mark, I do, I do want to add one thing, Mark. Uh, you know that I'm in a, a number of investment clubs, and uh, one of the biggest pieces of advice that we've been giving to each other in these clubs, even though the, the clubs that I'm in have extremely different personalities, uh, we've all been, been – trying to pull on the reins just a little bit and, and keep our clubs from uh, looking at lower quality stocks uh, that have uh, uh, expectations that might be a little bit uh, overblown or based on fewer facts than we're normally used to having. Um, you know, it's, it's harder and harder to find the the good solid uh, stocks that we'd like to put into our core holding or the the great solid small companies that look as good as the big companies. So this this holding onto the reins and 
and urging people to not settle for you know fourth or fifth or sixth best just because it happens to be in the buy zone um, is something that I'm finding all the clubs grappling with and at this point at least really succeeding with that idea <laughs> that you have to you have to stick with high quality you have to stick with stocks that are good solid uh, quality issues and that are trading at a price that will give you a nice solid return going into the future. Uh, that means that we're not being afraid at the moment to hold in one club at least significant piles of cash and in uh, three of the other clubs uh, more cash than we're usually holding and that's just because it's harder and harder to find things to invest in. Yeah, I, I'm with I you. Think that... I think you want to be stubborn about quality. And uh, you can really get hammered if you average down into lower quality stocks when that next bear market or recession hits. That's Those are the stocks that are going to get absolutely crushed. And you want to make sure you're not switching to those at this point in time. But having said that, there actually are some opportunities still out there, more than you would expect in an aging bull like this. Some of it has to do with some of that rotative corrective action that Sai was alluding to a few minutes ago. There are area, pockets where, I'll call them pockets of plateaus in stock price, and uh, they're out there, so you can find a few of them along the way. Well, you're right. We're finding interest in retail uh, where, yeah. where six months or 12 months ago, we never would have even looked at retail. Now we're looking at some retail again, yeah. a good high-quality retail that, that seemed to have uh, you know, built up fairly decent uh, walls against being Amazoned, this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I think we'll close with this last thought. This is just a tease sigh a little bit here. Um, one thing that we've seen actually go away this year is volatility. The you, When you look at this graph and when you think about what's been happening with stock prices and the, the VIX, which is an index of volatility, uh, stock price volatility has basically gone away. So, so Sai, does that mean this is now a risk-free market? <laughs> I, you must have read my mind, Mark. Uh, we, we do know that volatility is risk, and risk is volatility. So it is a risk-free market, and let's just go celebrate. Just, just <laughs> the bar the door. Let's go for it. All right, let's press on. All right. Uh, to the audience, especially if you're here for the first time, what we do every time a stock is selected by either one of the knights or a damsel or a, a guest damsel or a guest knight um, or the audience vote, we invest $1,000 in it. So in the case of Cognizant, as you can see on the screen here, let me see if I can grab and grab a quick pen here. As you can see with Cognizant, it, uh, it's been selected 12 times over the last seven and a half years. I believe nine of those by Cy Lynch. So 12, 12 times $1,000, $12,000 invested is now worth $22,000, which is a, a pretty decent, almost doubling of that situation. The second entry is even more fascinating. That's a three-time selection. $3,000 has become twenty, almost $21,000 now. So and you can see that shows up right here. So OLED, which is universal display, I'm sure we'll be talking about that on the hot seat sometime soon if the price continues to keep doing what it's doing. But as you can read down the list, what you're looking at here, there's actually about 90 companies in the tracking portfolio, which you can look at using that link. That's a public link up at the top of the page. Um, but you can look at all 90 positions. These are the top 20. Those averages and totals are for the full set of 90. So you can see the, the total number or total assets that are in. You can see that our growth rate is 10.5% on average. That's the average weighted sales growth forecast. We love for that to be in the 11% give or take range. The overall quality is 84.3, which is good. And you can see that the projected annual return, that last column, that last number on the far lower right, the average stock right now is, is hovering at about 6%. At 8.5, we'd really like to see that number get boosted up. The reason that it's low is the same thing we've been talking about here for a few minutes. So many of these stocks have taken off and gone up considerably with their stock prices. So that has actually driven those return forecasts down. The only way that that number can go up is if the stock prices go down or the fundamentals improve. We we prefer the fundamentals improving. Any comments on Mark, that? Mark, 
Yeah, a bookkeeping note, Mark. When we get to the discussion on Mesa Labs, I noticed that the uh, legend says that we've chosen it six times. We only identified five positions, so we must have missed the position in Mesa Labs okay. uh, in searching the, the spreadsheet. Okay, and as you can see here, size is going to bring price line, so that's an eight-time selection, so that'll be the ninth time. Priceline actually shows up right here, so we've done very well with it so far. Size so looking to double down on something that's worked out. And what was your stack, Ken? It's uh, it's going to be ten, it's going to be nine times, Mark. Don't yeah, curse it'll, it. it'll be the ninth time. Yes. <laughs> I'm bringing Ulta, Mark, and I know we've chosen Ulta more than once, maybe three or four times. Yeah, here it is. It's, uh, it's a four-time selection. It's a four-time selection, okay. All right, so, so just, uh, just so our audience understands, there's a couple of stale ideas out there that are coming tonight and one brand-new fresh one. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. He's, he's lobbying for votes. Okay, here we go. All right, Ken, will you, do you want to have some thoughts on uh, – what thoughts would you like to share about hot seat stocks? Well, we've we've been setting these selling triggers. We've been – playing around with some new selling discipline to add to all the time-honored selling things that we always uh, do and that we really truly absolutely believe in. Uh, but we've been looking at uh, price performance uh, relative to the market and relative to the industry that the stock happens to be in. You've seen presentations come from us now where we actually have a flow chart uh, that, that is kicked off when we're looking at a stock that is uh, sitting with a relative performance 20% less than where the market is, especially a stock that's looking like that in its first year uh, of, of purchase within the tracking portfolio. The other trigger that we've been looking at is, is we've noticed that uh, before a, a stock uh, kind of falls apart as far as price is concerned, We've noticed that many times quality tends to take a hit prior to that. And if you can keep track of that quality taking a hit, a lot of times you have as much as six or eight months uh, to move yourself out of the stock before the price actually collapses. Uh, we've shown that four or five times. And we're going to show an example of that again this evening where we're going to scamper out of a stock uh, prior to the price collapsing uh, because we've noticed a collapse in quality and we've actually tracked down what's causing the collapse in quality. So uh, why don't we get to our challenges and maybe we can better understand what the, the kind of things we're talking about, Mark. Yeah, and I think we should just reinforce that the first one that we're talking about here is selling stocks with low return expectations and the two that qualify the most at the top of the chart right here are urban outfitters and intel so we'll take a look at those and again if a stock is a is a core holding or you know a real solid blue chip we typically want to hang on until that par or the return forecast drops down towards money market rates which right now are running about one percent and so the, both of those qualify whether you call them core or not just just as a quick frame of reference here's a quick look at um, first of all, that's the LIBOR, which is pretty close to money market rates at the top. And you can see that they've actually climbed back up to 1% to 1.5%. Then we also kind of always keep the yield on the five-year treasury, five year being our time, one of our favorite time horizons, that's actually checking in at about 2.2%. So you could use either one of those numbers as a selling type guideline for a, a blue chip core holding. And here's a look at Urban Outfitters. Again, this is a stock which can be pretty uh, risky or volatile, as, as Cy points out. Um, no, it's it's it can be quite the trading stock. And I want to point out, uh, I actually recommended that we add this to the portfolio back in September of 2015 at around $30. And it's been quite a roller coaster since then. I want everybody to notice what has happened in the last three or four months. This is this is like throwing, you know, one of those lifesaver lifesaver cushions at Mark in the ocean before he drowns. <laughs> so uh, you know, this is it actually has gone all the way down to 16, and it's it's actually doubled in the last four months. So again, here's a quick look. 
at the company, it's it's uh the situation is that back on as recently as October 27th, the stock price was $23. It's actually up to $34 or $35 just a short time later. And you can see using growth assumptions of five to six percent. And again, I think value line's fairly optimistic with their 8.1. So you could have a tug of war over the two of these, but again, we're talking mid single digits for projected profit margin, net profit margin, identical PEs, which you could also assail a little bit. Just looking at this chart, value line's actually being kind of optimistic versus the trend. You could actually sell a 15 or 16 PE there. Notice that this confirms low single digit return expectations. So I think we should go ahead and accept the life saving cushion and uh, allow Mark to get out of town with uh, <laughs> I, I do I do know, Mark, that this whole concept of core holding and non-core holding uh, uh, really causes a lot of people to stop and do a lot of thinking. And and one kind of rule of thumb that I like to apply to a non-core holding is that I hardly ever consider a stock to be a core holding that doesn't have a a high quality rating attached to it. And when we're looking at Urban Outfitters, it has a pretty average quality rating attached to it. Mm -hmm. I think I'm remembering 50 something, is that right? That's correct. 59, I believe. Yeah, 59, yeah. So, so while that's not a terrible quality rating, I don't think it rises to the point where I would call this a core holding. And uh, that means that, that I might have even, in a real portfolio, I might have even started considering this one for a sale when its par value moved lower than the average par value for the stocks in the database. And Mark's already indicated this evening that the average par value tonight is around 6%. So even at a par of 5 or 4%, being a non-core holding, at least in my estimation, uh, I would certainly be ready to sell the thing. And uh, I don't have any problems with removing this from our portfolio, Mark. Okay, Sai, you concur? Yes, a absolutely. And I would just, uh, I mean, <clears throat> Ken mentioned where the uh, quality is now, which is at uh, 59, I believe. Um, but I would note that back between April and May, it dropped by about 20 points, um, uh, 20 percentile points. And actually, about a year earlier, dropped from about, dropped about 10. So, I mean, essentially, if you look at the quality history on Urban Outfitters, you get you're getting a stair step in the wrong direction. Uh, so, not only would I say um, the com combination of low return and low current quality, but you've also got a negative trend on the quality. Yeah, and that's that, we're going to talk about that same uh, characteristic for. Uh, Stock here in a minute. So we'll go ahead and jettison that one and, and, and just have fun. Let's talk a little bit about Intel. It's a two-time selection by the roundtable. Hugh and I both selected it back in the same time frame, March of 2013. The price was 1874 You can see that it is now, and this is another one. It's gone up in just the last couple months from 37 up to 47 a pretty good price surge. Uh, there's good things happening in the industry, no doubt about that, but again, even with some of the fairly more optimistic assumptions of 3% uh, sales growth, which is, again, kind of low for what we're trying to do here. it's uh, this is There's nothing wrong with this company. It's a great, large, blue-chip company, but it certainly falls into the large category with that 2 or 3% sales growth. Uh, very profitable company, always has been. But, uh, again, a return thanks to that recent run-up in price that we can dismiss it and – and perhaps wait for wait to come back to it again someday if it becomes an exquisite opportunity. Um, those are two pretty good positions for the roundtable portfolio, going from 18 to 47. Yeah, uh, this is one, Mark, that I would consider a core holding if, if people want to deal with, with the core, non-core issues. And at 2.4, that puts it equivalent to the five-year bond, and it's coming awfully close to the to the money market rate that we looked at it at between one and one and a half percent. So uh, I think that uh, we we are in a good place when we're looking to uh, perhaps uh, sell this uh, stock, even though it is a core holding. 
uh, when it approaches what you can get from cash, uh, I think that's the time to take your money and uh, reinvest it in something with more potential. All right. I concur. And the only thing I, I mentioned, I don't, uh, I suspect you don't have a slide, Mark, but I would encourage people to perhaps go, uh, if you're a subscriber, take a look at Intel's Chronicle and you'll see that its uh, current par is near uh, where, near its historical low and that uh, it tends to be a relatively consistent when par gets low, the price pulls back a little bit. Um, although sometimes it just kind of flattened. There, there also is the tendency to flatten and let business prospects catch up with it. But you've kind of alluded with the to the sell it and watch it and perhaps buy back in. Intel actually has a fairly decent little cycle of that over multiple years. You're not talking about trading it, but oh, yeah, it certainly you, appears to be an opportune time. You, probably have to be patient to wait for the next type of uh, opportunity that I think you and I both spotted back in uh, March of 2013. Right. And, exactly. and I think, think to be, be fair, we should also indicate that Intel has done a nice job of trying to bring its business model into the present. Uh, they're not just a, an old fashioned chip company. Uh, they've done a lot of work in a lot of newer areas and uh, they're, they're moving into the present with a lot of research and a lot of product uh, that uh, you wouldn't normally associate with a company that has the history that Intel has. Absolutely. They'll probably be involved in Bitcoin too. All right. All right, Ken, we'll let you take this one. I, I'll just I'll just note that okay. that uh, Tin Cup did sell Mesa Labs on on uh, the relatively low return forecast alone, as we had to raise the overall par for 10 cups. So kind of the same situation applies here. Take it away. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm looking at the Chronicle for Mesa Labs. I brought it to, to Mark's attention from the point of view of our new trigger that we've been talking about. Uh, we've discovered that when you have a huge drop in percentile points uh, in the par value, I'm sorry, in the quality value, as we're looking at here, here we're, we're looking at quality that's gone from maybe somewhere around 92 or 93 uh, at the top of that stair step down to somewhere around maybe 61 or 62 or 63. And that's a huge, huge drop. We have found that when that happens, we usually have five or six or more months where we can get out, get out of it before the price kind of collapses. The green bars are price, and notice while they've been up and down, they haven't entirely collapsed, and that last green bar is at the end of November. Uh, if this were on the website, we could actually hover on it and see that the price has actually improved a little bit uh, since the uh, end of November. Not much, but a little bit. And all in all, if we're going to test our theories, uh, why not test it on a portfolio where we're not actually losing money? Although three of the clubs that I'm involved with do own Mesa Labs, and I own Mesa Labs personally as well. So I'm involved in these same discussions in some of my clubs and uh, with my investing partner, uh, my wife uh, here at home as well. So I, I think that that quality drop uh, signifies an uh, idea that we might want to to pull the trigger and, and mo remove it from the portfolio. Uh, we've had nice performance from Mesa Labs in every single time that we've bought it. All of the times that we've bought it, and it's happened six times, uh, we've, we are beating the market at this point. So we're exiting the position with six relative returns that are all positive. And notice that that red line, uh, that's the uh, actual par value. Notice that that's down, just like Cy was alluding to with Intel, that red line down there is down near uh, recent historical lows. Uh, that's certainly not a time when you'd want to buy, uh, and it's probably a great time to be moving out of the stock. Mark uh, didn't have a lot of time to pull together another slide because I just sprung this on him at, at 8 o'clock Eastern time, but he did find a, a study that's not that old. It's just about uh, three weeks old 
where we can see the PE ratios moving up. Uh, the PE ratio for Mesa Labs is now somewhere in the mid 40s. Uh, people have been stubborn about not selling this very small stock. They only have about $100 million in uh, actual sales, so it is a very small stock. The PE ratio up into the mid 40s, and uh, what's been degrading the quality is the lowering of the margins as we move uh, into history, and that uh, along with uh, a little bit uh, of pressure uh, uh, coming from uh, the the actual, uh, I, I want to say profitability. Help me out with a word, Mark. Uh, the wow. the other thing that we discovered. Uh, yeah, well, there's with a couple, the lowering things, of the quality. Yeah. Yeah, a couple Go things work. This was a, a B plus financial strength company for a long time. Uh, it's actually there we are. Back okay. to B. Yeah. B may not sound bad to most people in the audience, but if you've been following Value Line for very long, that's a below average number, or a below average grade. Think parochially. So we've got that, the lowering of the financial strength, this uh, fairly steady decline in, in net margin, which which compares very unfavorably to other companies in the precision instrument group. But you don't have to really look any further than notice that the, the earnings have been fairly flat. The earnings for uh, 2018, even 2019 are projected to be at or below 2015. And you also see a flat spot here in sales. So I think this is a great case study of, like Ken was just saying, with, with many companies we've found there is a, three to six to nine month window where you can exit from a situation like this while everybody's being stubborn and take advantage of the situation and, uh, and preserve some capital. You know, the other way to look at this, well, and, go ahead. And, well, if you go back to that Chronicle for just an instant, uh, notice that if we would have been applying this discipline as soon as that quality took the first hit, uh, we would have been exiting with even a higher uh, price than we're exiting with right now. And if we would have gotten stubborn and waited for the second hit in the downward direction, we again would have been exiting at a, at a higher price than, than uh, we're at right now. So there's, uh, you know, it, it's, it's telling us something. We only have six or seven examples so far, so we don't have anything by any means to prove anything. But so far, we really like the way that this particular trigger is acting, and it's getting us out of stocks uh, before we lose uh, a lot of money and before they, the positive relative return moves to negative relative return. Good stuff. Any comments or th things to add to that, Cy? No, I think y'all covered it well. All right, so we'll go ahead and, and uh, put those three positions to rest. I do want to point out that I did have a couple of those positions on uh, not just Intel, but on Mesa Labs, so certainly uh, helping my performance. Well, you said you had one on the Urban Outfitters too, didn't you? Yeah, but that was kind of a, a tie. We'll just leave it at that. <laughs> an, an approximate tie. Oh, that was that that was just selective memory. Okay, I got it. Oh yeah, I'm remembering it quite well. I was nothing selective was it was selective failure to mention. <laughs> All right, so let's go ahead and switch to our stock presentations. We like we I want to remind the audience we will take Q and A after with the three presentations. So keep that in mind if you see something you want to ping away at. Sai is going to actually do that. Is is it the ninth time selection of Priceline Sai? Uh, it it's the eighth, but when the audience uh, agrees, it will be the ninth. So okay, very very uh, good. My, my pick is the eighth. So uh, so yes, this is the eighth uh, pick on Priceline, and uh, here you can see pretty decent up straight and parallel uh, records and uh, good uh, projections going forward. Uh, let's move to the next slide. I'll go ahead and give uh, the typical first two slides or, or so that I give almost every month just showing you uh, where the idea came from uh, and we'll come back to this slide uh, right near the end of the presentation um, and I'll talk more about it from a portfolio management standpoint but I just uh, took the 
um, round table portfolio ranked it by par and uh, just started skimming down I, i'm not i i was going to say i'm not particularly comfortable uh with most of the yellow uh, stocks but that's not entirely true i think there's certainly some uh, good quality there cbs perhaps although cbs uh we don't know what cbs is going to be uh going forward um, with the potential uh, acquisition of Aetna. Um, but but I kind of decided not to go into the yellow, so I was looking at the top of the green. I was leaning toward accumulating something. I've circled uh, quality companies that I'm familiar with, most of which uh, I believe I have uh, at least one time um, added to the roundtable portfolio. I believe also all of those to include Priceline for disclaimer purposes. I personally own, I, no, I do not personally own Alliance Data, uh, but all of the others I do uh, personally own as well. Um, and so you see Priceline is near the top uh, in, with both an excellent quality, a, a good uh, near, near the top of the green, that being my par plus five um, uh, par value, and also notice a good healthy growth rate. We haven't talked about growth rate uh, too much tonight from a portfolio perspective, but the uh, portfolio could stand to use a little bit of uh, increase in the, the growth rate. I know that uh, Ken would uh, like that because as you can see here, it's eight and a half percent. So when you can find a good quality, high growth company uh, to add, that's a good thing. Uh, next slide. I also always like to just say, okay, when I have found a stock <clears throat> in the portfolio that has attractive uh, characteristics, let's go ahead and do a stock screen um, using stock search and see if there's any other stocks outside of the portfolio in the manifest Solomon universe uh, that may share characteristics that we would want to consider. Here you can see I did a quality. I went ahead and bumped it down to 90 um, rather than trying to screen against 98 because as you can see from this, I would have had Red Hat and Priceline would have been my only two uh, options had I tightened, made it that tight. I usually go a little below. Uh, I did the same thing with financial strength, said let's look at a 90 and uh, also a little, little lower on the growth. And uh, here are the companies that popped up. And you see that again, Priceline comes in at uh, tied for, I'm sorry, tied for second in quality and uh, also second uh, in par and the highest green. So um, all of all of that, uh, Celgene would have been the only company I might have considered. And again, it's a bit more in the yellow than I really wanted to uh, take a look at for purposes of tonight. So next slide. I promise that we would go back to uh, that uh, round table slide because I think probably everybody on the call knows Priceline. As we've mentioned, it's a, uh, this is the eighth time it's been selected. Uh, Ken and I have both done it and there may be some, some other uh, selections out there that I don't recall off the top of my head. But Priceline is of course in the online travel retail business. Um, and uh, it is a a high growth company, as you see from the projections, it can also be a relatively volatile company. Um, part of the reason it's such a good buy potential right now is that the price has pulled back about 10 or 15% in the last month or so, uh, although it is still participating very much in that upswing uh, in that it's very strong up year to date and over 12 months and, and even more uh, farther back historically, but uh, the price has pulled back a little bit. Looks like it could be a good uh, buying opportunity. But I wanted to mention a little bit, uh, rather for a moment, even though that we don't manage the roundtable portfolio as a managed portfolio, it's just a tracking portfolio. I wanted for a moment pretend that this is perhaps your portfolio and you were looking and uh, to um, encourage uh, the buying of stocks that you already own. And just take a look at, notice Priceline from a perspective of the portfolio, although it is one of, 
for our uh, teasing purposes. It's been picked a lot of times, and uh, I may get accused of being stubborn for now picking it again, but notice it's only 3.8% of the portfolio. So it's, it's not a huge amount of, if this were your personal portfolio, there's plenty of room to, uh, for both price appreciation uh, gains there that you would hold, as well as uh, adding or accumulating a position. Again, very high quality and uh, good solid par. What I consider, and again, I would say any of those four companies that I've circled, I'm both familiar with, as well as they have good uh, quality numbers, good par numbers, and there's nothing strange going on with them. So let's, for a moment, evaluate. Do I want to accumulate um, Starbucks, Alliance Data, uh, or Cognizant, perhaps? And you can pretty much say the same thing about any of those I didn't circle. Uh, the analysis would work uh, just as well. And here are the factors that I tend to consider when I'm trying to decide what stock would I like to accumulate of a current holding? I look first of all, of course, at par and pretty much on an equal with par. I mean, both par and quality have to be uh, excellent. I don't want a low return stock and I don't want a low quality stock. So those are, are about equal in priority, but those are the two keys, but not far uh, past that. Certainly an important tiebreaker or, or decision tilter is financial strength again particularly in an aging bull market like we have right now so that's that's my third and again pretty close to financial strength although uh, i tilt a little bit more toward the financial strength uh, importance but but they're both uh, very important is the growth rate notice again looking at these um, alternatives of the circled ones price line is the highest growth rate. So that would be the tiebreaker there. But even if you look at uh, other, um, Mercado Libre uh, has significantly higher growth. Um, and Ulta Beauty that Ken's uh, looking at tonight and then uh, uh, Artilex at, at the top. Those are about the only um, higher growth rates. There's a couple that are pretty comparable um, so again, on the growth rate, again, yield is irrelevant to price line as it has no yield. And I don't place a lot of importance on yield. But again, if, if a stock, again, I'm looking at tiebreakers, if one stock has a significant yield and another one I'm considering doesn't, I might lean a little bit more toward the yield. Uh, similar thing with earnings stability. Uh, I would say I don't worry that much about earnings stability as long as it's uh, somewhere in the uh, 70 or so above uh, or above uh, category. That's usually going to get us pretty close to the up straight and parallel. Uh, but again, in this tighter market, uh, I will emphasize that a little bit more. So, uh, but again, you could see of the circled companies, everybody's uh, in pretty good shape, although there are several uh, in here that uh, would fall out the first two, Fossil and uh, Artilex. Um, and you've got a few others that are a bit below the 70. I thought there was, there's a 19 uh, alt source. I thought there was a 50, so yeah, I guess Skyworks. So there's a number of, of companies there. And then finally, and truthfully, this is, I've, as I say in classes and so forth, this really is more of a, risk factor or a comfort factor, but I do look at the projected PE. If one stock is a uh, uh, expected return of 15% and that's based on a 50 PE and Priceline can give me 15% uh, at a 22 PE and they're otherwise equal, I'm probably going to lean toward uh, the 22 PE. Um, that's not to say that the 50 may be a very rational selection. Um, but that drastic a difference, uh, that could be a tiebreaker. So that's, a, a, I just wanted to take a couple minutes and give, give a little bit of insight into a portfolio management, uh, how I would have come up with Priceline uh, using this as a portfolio. And then the last slide, Mark. And this is just uh, my uh, personal judgments, uh, which are roughly in line with Manifest. Ultimately, I think my margin's a little lower 
than uh, the uh, consensus analyst and manifest. My sales growth is a little bit higher, uh, but it kind of works it works out. I am slightly in the yellow, as you can see, compared uh, to uh, the just at the top of the green uh, that the um, consensus manifest uh, analyst did. I will point out on here, I failed to update that uh, uh, current earnings per share. So that current PE ratio is wrong. That actually should be 24.9. So essentially the the correct current trailing PE is roughly at the PE forecast. And so I uh, am adding another price line position. Okay. Good growth, good return. Fits pretty well. I just added the Chronicle to show that it's consistent quality and relatively high return forecast. Done pretty well here lately. All right, with that, Ken, we'll go to your repeat selection of Ulta Beauty. But if I unmute myself, sounds real good. Uh, Mark, could you go back to slide 18 real quickly before I start this part of the presentation? What is slide 18? That one. That one right there, because uh, size, uh, complete portfolio uh, analysis kind of thing is almost exactly what I did to come up with Ulta Beauty as well. Um, I was looking, uh, for me, the, the sales growth was very important because I, I don't think we have enough growth in this tracking portfolio. So uh, I was looking at the current portfolio and looking for high growers. Uh, the first one on the list, way up there at the top, uh, Artelex, uh, I just uh, I, I don't look at a yellow background stock that has a low quality rating in, and that's what Artelex looks like. Uh, the second one on the list, for that matter, does too. Uh, but when I get down to Ulta, I see a yellow background. It's not that much above the top of the the sweet spot, but it's combined with a an extremely high quality rating of 98. So that's why it stayed in, in my uh, thought processes. Uh, Cy, when he did his uh, uh, screen, uh, used financial strength. I think he said 90 uh, or above. And if you yes. look at the financial strength of, of Ulta, you'll see it's at 89. That's why it didn't appear on Cy's screen. But uh, 89, uh, I'll take 89 uh, for a financial <laughs> strength. Uh, with not too many. I would agree with that. Yes. And I'm looking at a, at a pretty decent, uh, you know, we both think that 70, 75 is, is a pretty decent minimum for earning stability uh, when we're looking at one of these uh, core kind of holdings. So there's where my choice of Alta comes from. I started in the exact same place I did, and I just went shopping uh, three or four or five stocks higher than he did. But again, focusing on the exact same things uh, that he focused on. I think that's why the three of us, uh, our investing philosophies tend to mesh so nicely with each other is because we all seem to think that the same things are really important when it comes to putting a portfolio together. Uh, now we can go to that first slide of mine, Mark. Yeah, and in fact, Alta Beauty is the Solomon Select newsletter stock for this month, so we obviously oh, agree, agree in many ways. <laughs> I didn't even know that. So that <laughs> um, uh, this, uh, the first seven or eight slides here are from a, an Ulta Beauty uh, presentation that was first given on June 14th, 2017. So uh, we have another quarter uh, that's fallen in since then, and I'll speak to that in a couple of different places. But uh, Ulta Beauty thinks that one of its strengths is the fact that it has uh, 990 locations in 48 states, uh, and 90% of them are not in malls. They're freestanding or they're in what we would call up here in Michigan strip malls. They're in places where there's maybe four or five other stores uh, attached to them in a strip. They have a huge product mix, and more and more, uh, their stores are offering services, full salon services, which uh, Amazon is going to be hard pressed to to meet, no matter how big that particular company gets. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, Ulta makes the point that the beauty market is highly fragmented. I did not realize how fragmented until they told me that there were more than seven. 
70,000 places that you could buy beauty products. And they just tried to categorize uh, some of the different types of places where you could buy these beauty supplies. And that circle has an awful lot of chunks to it right there. So you can read as well as I do. It's a very, very fragmented market. Next slide. Uh, what's important as far as Ulta is concerned is that they hold a relatively small piece uh, of the different parts uh, of the market. Uh, there's $134 billion in the U.S. beauty market, and you can see that by Ulta's definition, uh, they have uh, uh, fairly small percentages uh, of different segments of that market. So from their point of view, there's a lot of room to grow, uh, and they're not going to run out of potential places to gain new customers anytime in the near future. Next slide. Um, what I like to see is when a company tells me how it's going to try to get more money from the customers that it already has walking into its stores. And this was a, a, a slide that, that particularly struck a chord with me. Uh, when you can find a customer that's omni-channel, what that means is that they not only buy online and they not only, but they also go to the store. They do both. Okay. When you can find a customer like that and they call their customers guests, uh, those customers tend to spend almost three times as much as a normal customer that only shops online or that only shops in the store. And they tend to shop two and a half times more often than store only guests. So uh, I, I'm thinking to myself uh, that they really need to be pushing their online uh, product so they can gather more of these omni channel guests. And sure enough, that's one of the things that Ulta is really pushing very, very hard. Next slide, Mark. Uh, they've also discovered that if they can get uh, a woman to spend time in their salon portion of their store, in the portion of the store that gives services, that these people spend three times more than non-salon guests, and they shop twice as frequently as non-salon uh, customers do. Uh, right now, salon customers are only 6% uh, of the people that are shopping at these stores. So here's another large undertapped resource that Ulta can move to to grow its business. And these are the kind of things that I'm always looking for. How will the company grow in the future? Next slide, please. Uh, Ulta has a, uh, a near-term plan of building lots of stores. And if you remember the first slide, which you probably don't, uh, the store count uh, at the middle of the year was around 990. Uh, and the store count has now moved uh, during this year to about 1,074. And uh, I'm going to show in a couple of slides that it's actually moved past that. You can see where they're concentrated. And you can see that there's, uh, I mean, even discounting the the, the, the mountains and the desert in the middle of the country, uh, there's still a fair amount of white space where Ulta can, can uh, build some stores and, and move in and, and create some business for itself. So uh, their stores are not going to be built forever, and they're going to have to find other ways to grow their business. And I think I already told you two other ways, uh, build their online business and build their salon businesses. Next slide. Uh, they are rapidly growing their e-commerce business. In 2016 fiscal year, it grew by 56%. Uh, you can see that the numbers are fairly small, uh, but uh, they're still growing really, really quickly. Next slide, please. And I pulled some paragraphs from their third quarter earnings call. Uh, in the third quarter, which is not reflected in these slides that I just showed you, their e-commerce business grew almost 63%. 
And for the first nine months of the year, just to show that that 63 wasn't a fluke, for the first nine months, they grew their e-commerce business by 68% compared to the previous nine months. So there's a lot of effort moving into the online sales of these cosmetics, ramping up so that when you want to buy cosmetics online, you would move to Ulta rather than to some other online provider. Uh, also, these store models right now, uh, the, at the end of the third quarter, the stores uh, had uh, increased by 86 stores. Uh, the slide that I showed you was at 78 uh, or so new stores. And so you can see that not only are they adding new stores, but they're remodeling and they're relocating stores uh, that are having a little bit of difficulty with location and therefore with, uh, with sales. Uh, next slide, please. The financial outlook, this was guidance as of the end of May this particular year. And they wanted to uh, grow their sales between 9 and 11%. And their sales are an upward trajectory. They wanted to open about 100 stores and remodel 11. Well, they've already remodeled 10 at the end of the third quarter. And they've opened 86 uh, stores by the end of the third quarter. So they're well on their way to meeting that particular goal for the fiscal year. And they wanted to grow their business, their e-commerce business by about 50%. And they've been growing it in excess of 60%. They'd like to deliver their earnings growth in the mid 20% range. Uh, these are all uh, things they'd like to do, goals that they've set. Uh, but I like to see a company that not only sets goals, but communicates those because then I can go back and measure uh, how well are they actually doing compared to what they said they were going to do. Next slide, please. I went to value line. I'm getting a, uh, a decent uh, low projected return of about 10%, a high return of about 22%. Uh, I do find that for good steady growing companies uh, in the mid-range that the low number tends to be uh, where my uh, conservative SSG tends to land. I do note however that as I look at companies that are growing more quickly than say maybe 11 or 12 percent that my SSG number and a lot of the analysts tend to be between these numbers rather than at the bottom number. So as the company grows more quickly, uh, I find that, that value lines uh, projection, I tend to uh, look at the low for a slower grower and maybe move up a couple notches for a quicker grower. I'm looking at the annual rates box sales for three to five years at 18%, earnings at 20, nothing to sneeze at there. Both numbers that probably are uh, cannot not probably, that definitely cannot be sustained for long, long periods of time. But I think there's always a chance to sustain numbers like that for three, four, five, six years. We've seen many great companies able to grow this quickly for that type of a time period. Uh, next slide, please. Here's the Chronicle. And uh, boy, this is what I like to see. There, there's this some steps. Uh, early on, not major ones, staying all within the 80th to 100th percentile. But more recently, the steps are moving in the right direction. They're moving up. And I think the most recent quality is 98. Uh, I'm also looking at the par line. That's the red line. And I'm looking at it kind of across the whole graph. And the par that it's trading at right now is in the range of historically high rather than historically low. Uh, I'm also seeing prices have taken a little bit of, hit, of a hit in the last three or four months. Uh, I will say that analysts were a little bit concerned uh, about the near-term guidance that the company gave for sales, uh, and that took a hit on the price. Uh, there was also a lot of chatter at the last earnings report about whether or not Ulta could withstand Amazon moving into cosmetic sales. Well, I think that can be said of almost anybody that sells anything. 
Uh, I just don't think Amazon has the capability of moving into every single industry that exists. And I'm willing to uh, give this company that has a pretty decent track record so far to give it the chance to play, uh, you know, nose to nose with with the competitors and see how it, it does. I'm very encouraged by the fast growth in e-commerce uh, from this company. Next slide, please. Uh, there's the traditional lines that we're used to seeing, and uh, this could be a textbook for Up Straight and Parallel. Here's the analyst consensus numbers coming from Morningstar. Uh, they seem to think sales will grow at about 17% for the next two years and earnings at about 17% for the next five years. Uh, I was very conservative in putting this together, and I decided to, to move my uh, estimate for earnings growth and sales uh, growth down to 15. Uh, I'm looking at margins that are moving in the right direction. I'm looking at, at really excellent return on equity numbers, and it's all being done with a zero debt balance sheet. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I decided on a PEs of 35. That might be a little bit rich for some of you, but you know, a company that's growing 15 to 17%, I think can carry a 35 PE at the high side and not be considered overvalued. Uh, I chose 23 at the low end. Uh, and when I put those PEs in along with my growth estimates, I get this uh, stock to be a buy with about a nine to one upside downside, total return of about 20% by my SSG. Uh, I'll take that uh, if it can deliver it to me. In fact, if it can only deliver uh, the projected average return, the par value, which we use, which is 15.7, I'll gladly take that any day uh, from almost any stock that I own. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, here we are looking at some of the numbers from Manifest. Again, there's that extremely high quality. My 15.7 is certainly close enough to Mark 17.7 to the analyst 17.7. And remember, these aren't Mark's numbers. These are the analyst numbers that, that we're parsing here. And that's 17.7, uh, slightly in the yellow, which means it's a little bit more than 10% above the top uh, of the market. If the average in the market is six, then the top of the sweet spot is six plus 10 or 16. Uh, we're, you know, one and a half, two percent above that. And with this high quality, I'm willing to go shopping in that particular uh, area. I'm looking at the the nice comparison that Manifest gives me when I do this kind of work. And it says that the top five stocks in the specialty retail sector, uh, the first one is Ultra, followed by the other five that you can take a look at. Uh, to be honest, I'm not familiar with the fifth one, Mark or Cy. Do you, either one of you know what TPR is? Um, I don't. That's Tapestry. It's Coach. Coach. It's uh, oh, oh, no wonder Coach. I don't know. It's new, <laughs> okay. It's the new name I for Coach, Tapestry. I, okay. I had forgotten that name. Okay, yeah. yes, I do know Coach. I don't Yeah. And the other ones are TJX, that's TJ Maxx, Marshalls, and Home Goods, and Five Below, and Nutrisystems. So Ulta uh, you know, looks really good for me, and I'm gonna I'm gonna ask to place another uh, a holding in the Roundtable portfolio right. of Ulta Beauty, ULTA. Thanks, Ken. So we'll go ahead and do that. All right, I'm going to go ahead and finish out here for in a couple of minutes. Mine is actually a fairly conventional selection, a little different. Um, but what I want to spend just a moment on is for at a couple of these sessions over the last year or so, even going back maybe three or four years, we've talked from time to time about the global recession and what that meant for companies like Cognizant and uh, the fact that it was something that's real and was really weighing down, especially on some of these international providers like Cognizant. And uh, I think this is probably one of the more powerful pictures of, of explaining why this recovery, especially in the United States, has been so annoying. And the, part of the reason has been the globe has really been a mess. You're looking at global earnings here, courtesy of FactSet and Ritholtz Wealth Management. This is a, from a presentation they made to their uh, shareholders. 
or the clients. And you can see that, uh, again, anytime your earnings per share, your margins plummet, it's, it's basically a condition that's uh, consistent with being in a recession. And I've shaded those in gray. And look at how much of the last eight to nine years on a global, from a global perspective has actually been pretty nasty. And then by the same token, over the last year, the last calendar year, how nice the recovery has actually been on a global basis. And we certainly have seen that from, again, companies like Cognizant. So pretty nice slide to explain some of the frustrations of the, the global markets and that sort of thing. And I basically wanted to think about, you know, as Sai has made the point several times, some of the return forecasts are low. This is an aging bull market. Maybe we want to go looking for companies that might benefit a little bit from this situation. And the one I want to turn everybody's attention to is Bemis. The name of the company down here in the lower right is Bemis. The ticker symbol is BMS. They're a packaging company. And they package and make, you know, basically boxes and wrappings and, and stuff for, I, I'm going to say just about everybody, you know, from cereal boxes to all types of food products to paper products, like from Kimberly Clark, Tyson, poultry and, and meats, Pepsi and Coke, candy bars. Uh, there's very little missing from here, toothpaste. And again, this is kind of one of those situations where I'm thinking about this is not the, the most sexy company that you can come up with. The returns are not that strong. The quality is strong, but not, you know, not out of the off the charts to the top. But this is a company that's, you know, well positioned, well leveraged. Two thirds of their business is in the United States, one third outside. Many of these are multinational firms. Again, I think they're leveraged into this global situation. And again, it doesn't matter whether General Mills or Kellogg's wins; they make the boxes for both of them. So it's a it's a situation that I really find most comfortable. And uh, I'd like the return to be a little bit higher, but it, again, it's it's relatively high compared to what it very often is. And here's a look at the company. Again, we're talking about uh, not a sexy situation. I realize that this is a little bit lower growth rate, but we're trading off to, to um, basically balance the portfolio a little bit with a very consistent company in the mid-single digits when it comes to growth rate. Again, the mid-single digits, somewhere around 5% for the growth rate. And uh, very steady profit margins that are improving. Again, this is no different than if you looked at your Section 2A on a stock selection guide. Just looking at a visual representation of that, that graph shows you a, a, a very nice improving situation for the company. Very easy to sell or buy into uh, on that margin somewhere in that 6 to 7% range. That's what the analysts are looking for, approaching 7% margins over the long term. And again, the P.E., not all over the map, uh, as, as I would say, virtually risk-free because there's no volatility in that PE. We're looking at a PE in the 17 to 18 range. So those these three things, three conditions are fairly easy to buy into and accept. Again, they're not flashy. This is not going to be the, the universal display of the portfolio, but maybe it gives us some bedrock. And again, with the average stock trading at about 6%, this one bringing in an 8% price appreciation and a couple percent, a very healthy dividend. We're talking about a, a 10% return for a company that really is leveraged pretty much across the board. Pretty healthy situation, and, and I basically like it. Um, the quality, again, is, is in that 80 range, give or take. It has taken a little bit of a bump down, so that's something that we'll be watching, but nothing too serious. It's hovering around that 80 level, and again, uh, notice how tight that return forecast is over time. doesn't seem to stray very much, fairly tightly bound. And again, with a number somewhere up in this range, with the next update, we're basically going to be up here, somewhere in this range up in here. It's at uh, multi-year highs, another condition that we all like to see. So again, I'm not, I'm not selling this as price line. This is not universal display. It's not even cognizant, but it's a very solid company, which I think gives us a uh, pretty good footing, especially if we run into a, a challenging bear market or recession anytime soon. I think this one actually performs fairly well under those conditions. So we'll go ahead and add Bemis to the portfolio. Solid company that I've, I've liked for a long time. So with that, Ken, I think we can go ahead and do the audience poll. 
if you're out there and ready and still vertical. I am. I am. I'm just uh, getting it launched. Here we go. If you would just take your mouse and choose one of these right here, and when we get up to about 80, 80 85, 90 percent voting, we'll close the poll down. It doesn't take any effort, and we encourage every single one of you to cast your, your vote. Uh, it's a little bit hard, we've discovered, to cast a poll vote if you're on a phone, and some tablets are causing a little bit of problem with the go to meeting polls, but for the most part, uh, you should be able to vote. We're at 84% voting. Uh, I'll give it about five more seconds. Uh, give us a, a choice here going on. Uh, we just hit 85, so I'm going to close the poll down. And I'm going to show the results of the poll. And it looks like we're going to add another position in Ultra Beauty uh, at 62%. So I guess the, the conclusion that Cy and I can draw is that all of our fans are on tablets and cell phones. <laughs> that that has right. to be it, Mark. Okay. <laughs> I think you are uh, right, Mark. <laughs> there has to be some perk for doing this all the time, Mark. You know? There you go. There uh, you. So uh, I'm going to... Uh, hide this poll and we're back to uh, the coming attractions. Uh, our next roundtable will be more than a month away now. It'll be at the end of January on the traditional last uh, Tuesday. Uh, Mark and I are going to travel to St. Louis in March. Uh, that looks like St. Patty's Day, is it, Mark? It's pretty close. Close enough. Yes, uh, I think they're going to have to, to treat us some to some green stuff, okay? Uh, in 2018, we're also going to be in the Cincinnati-Dayton area in April. And, of course, uh, all three of us will be at the Better Investing National Convention in May. Uh, if you have an event that you'd like Mark or myself to uh, appear at, uh, we'd be glad to negotiate with you about whether or not we can uh, make it happen. Uh, just give us a call. And uh, with that, uh, I want to wish my two good friends the merriest of Christmases, and I hope 2018 is as good to us as investors <laughs> as 2017 has been. Well, thank you much. Uh, thank Any you, final Ken. comments, Merry Mark? Merry Christmas to you too, and I agree. Let's hope for a repeat in 2018. I, I look forward well, to taking out that five percentage point line this year. <laughs> uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to close the uh, roundtable itself, stop the recording, but we are going to stay on and try to answer some of your questions. So uh, 